So let's talk a little bit about screening and selecting and identifying students. And the reason I'm going over screening and identification is because oftentimes this is the time of year that people begin to do that. And also I've noticed during my monitoring visits, it's something that it's an area that we need to cover just to make sure we're all on the same page. So this is kind of a graphic that helps to kind of show the selection and identification process. You want to screen, you want to collect the evidence. Uh, you may want to meet, you, you'll need to meet with your GT selection and placement committee or your primary talent pool committee. Uh, if you have students who maybe don't have all the evidence they need, you want to place those students on a watch list and begin and continue to gather that evidence. And then uh, the GT selection and placement committee, remember, helps uh, to make those decisions about who is identified and selected for the program and also the level of services that are offered on the gifted student service plan. Remember, it's not all up to the gifted coordinator or the gifted teacher. It is very important that that um, be a part of your process and procedures. I think there may be someone whose uh, microphone is still on, so if you turn that off, that would be great. All right, and, and also um, after that is done, then we notify the parents and guardians of their gifted student service plan, and we do that annually. We usually do that at the beginning of the school year. All right, let's talk a little bit about primary talent poll pool. I want to go over this uh, list and maybe give some examples or elaborate a little bit. And I think we've got some people that need to need to mute themselves. So Hannah, if you could kind of maybe take care of that for me, because I can't always see that. If you can see who it is, just send them a little, little message. That would be great. All right, so primary talent pool. Remember that's uh, students that are selected from grades of kindergarten through third grade. And uh, these are students that are assessed or evaluated informally. Uh, we want to remember that the regulation says that we can't exclude students from primary talent pool based on assessment measures or assessment scores. Uh, you can use scales, you know, to help diagnose these uh, students. Oftentimes people use their district diagnostic assessments. They may use their Brigant's, Brigant's uh, kindergarten screener or they may use some other sort of diagnostic screener. Uh, you could use a scale like the HOPE scale or U-STARS could be used. Um, it's really important to train teachers if you're going to um, use these types of products. And I'm not endorsing any of those products. Those are just some uh, tools that are out there. And if you want to know more about those, you can Google them or you can contact me. Um, you want to remember we want to be inclusive. We want to cast a wide net, you know. Um, and we want to include students from all five areas. We want to include, you know, kids who are um, high achievers academically, but we also want to include uh, students who are creative, who are talented in, in the visual and performing arts areas of dance, music, uh, drama, and visual art. Also for leadership, you can begin looking for those leaders and collecting information, putting people on your watch list. Uh, remember that you can use referrals, uh, but when we use referrals, make sure that uh, you know that they give some um, concrete evidence about why they are referring that, that student. And um, also remember we have to collect a minimum of three evidences for our students who are going to be referred for primary talent pool. And then once you've collected those evidences, those uh, students evidences need to be reviewed by your primary talent pool committee. So here are some uh, choices for evidence. And um, I'm not going to go over every single thing there, but just to say that to me, when you're collecting evidence, it's kind of like gathering fruit for a fruit basket or vegetables. You want to remember that you want to use multiple criteria, not the same criteria that you have uh, checked um, in three different ways. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, I'm going to talk about these these things here on the next couple of slides as weather as well. But remember, you want to gather multiple uh, items, different types of items as you're looking at the whole child. 
Here uh, are some look fors that you might think about or you might want to share with your um, staff or with parents because sometimes they're wondering, you know, do they have a high potential child? So uh, here are some things to be looking for. Uh, you know, a student that seems to know a little something about everything. I'm sure you've had students who, who are like that or an intense interest about something. I know I had a student that was in kindergarten. He was very interested in the Titanic and he knew a lot about all the things that went on, went on with the Titanic. Problem solving. And these are students who attempt to solve difficult problems. Uh, you give them something to do and they, they want to do maybe something even more involved. They make connections between uh, different subject areas. For example, if you're talking about symmetry and math and then they go to art class and they hear about symmetry, they make those connections between those two curriculum areas. They have advanced communication skills. And sometimes, as you know, students have these advanced communication skills. They can often sidetrack your whole class. So uh, thinking skills, they have an excellent memory and behavior. They're intensely curious. Now, of course, not every child's going to have every single one of these characteristics, but these are some things to be looking for and to share with your staff that they can be looking for to help you. OK, let's talk a little bit about staff and parent recommendations. We often uh, use our staff and our parents to help us find students. They're kind of our child find um, partners, if you will. You know, IDEA or for special education has a child find process, and we often uh, look to our staff and parents to help us with this. So it's just really important, especially for our staff, to, to train them so that they know what to look for. You know, in conversations I've had with staff this past year and in years uh, prior to this year, staff want to help. They want to help us find those high potential advanced learners in our for our program, but they're not always sure how to do that. And so it's very helpful for them if there are checklists for them to look at, if there's training provided. You can do this in many different ways. You can do a short fact, uh, present at a short faculty meeting. Uh, you can set up times to talk with uh, your your staff during PLCs, the professional learning community times. Um, maybe even during you know planning times, y'all you can talk about these things. Um, you can make a video and you can post it for easy access and availability. I've known several different districts who've done that. Who are trying to meet the needs of their really busy uh, teachers, and this makes it e easy for them to access it at any time. You can send out an email you know, with uh, uh, that describes what you're looking for, directions to the referral forms. It's a, it's a good idea to put those referral forms and that information maybe into a Google Classroom or post it on your district website. Um, you can also schedule in-person uh, meetings and parent nights. For parents, it's really important for them to know, uh, you know, when and where and what uh, they're doing as far as uh, filling out a questionnaire or you know what to do when they fill out a referral form. I know when I was a parent and hadn't been part of uh, wasn't a part of the gifted program and I got an um, you know information home through my child's backpack about this is the time to refer your child for gifted services. I didn't know what in the world they were talking about. I didn't know anything about the gifted program. I had no clue and when I saw all those forms, I thought I was supposed to refer my child for everything. So I think it's really important to uh, maybe have some videos that you post upon your district web page that explains the process or have some parent nights. Um, during this time, you know, where we have to be socially, socially distant, it might be better to uh, do some sort of a video or maybe do a Zoom meeting with parents. Y'all are creative folks and so it's important to um, to think, you know, about how that can be done in, during this time. Uh, it's also really important to uh, think about the different venues where you might have these these parent nights. You know, some parents may not feel very comfortable coming into a school building. It might be good to go to that um, that community center there and host a, a parent night or a church or some other place where people meet, but it's in their community rather than maybe them coming to school. And also it's really important to think about the different languages that our students are coming from, that we have the communications in our different languages, that maybe we have a translator there to help uh, translate information 
uh, for those parents who maybe come to our parent nights or who are part of those videos. Don't forget to mute yourself if you can. All right, let's talk about formal identification now that we've talked about primary talent pool. So let's get started. You know, to me, it's kind of like a, a sleuth or a detective sometimes as you're looking for evidences. And um, but we just want to remember that we want to seek talent continually. You know, oftentimes when I talk to parents or to the staff, they think it's a one and done that we, uh, you know, start to select students at the end of third grade for services at fourth grade or that fourth grade is the time that we begin to screen and identify students. And after that, we never darken the door screening or identification. And I know that you and I know that, but I don't think that our parents and staff know that. So it's really important to get that message out to them through, like I said, those training opportunities, um, through just communication with them, which I know a lot of you are really good at. Remember that to screen in all five areas, um, we don't have screeners up on the KDE website, unfortunately, uh, for all these five areas. But one way to screen for that, again, is to look at maybe, you know, a screener of some kind or a scale of some kind that will help you uh, find those students that will bubble to the top, like the HOPE scale, or maybe, uh, you know, a scale for identifying gifted students, the SIGs. There are many different types of scales that are listed in the GT Coordinator Sample Handbook that could help you with that process where you wouldn't have to give, you know, a whole battery of tests that you could just screen and then give, you know, a, a deeper dive into an assessment. It's really important, like I said before, to be keeping a watch list of students. Um, you know, you may have, you may be walking down the hall and Miss Smith says to you, hey, you know, I've noticed that Johnny is really a creative student. He is always thinking of different ideas to solve a problem, you know, and it would be a really good idea to say, hey, Miss Smith, I may not remember that by the time I get back to my office or my classroom. Could you shoot me an email about that? And, you know, I love spreadsheets. I think Excel spreadsheets are the greatest things since sliced bread. And if I were you, I would think about maybe, you know, keeping a watch list of these students and also starting to collect evidence for these students. It's really important that we all follow the regulation criteria. You know, every time I look at the regulations, I always see something that I hadn't seen before. Then you would think by now, after eight years, that I would have seen it all. But I have to admit that there are things that I think about, that I ponder over, that I, I hadn't really seen before. So I would like for you to do the same. Get out your regulations, look at section three, especially when it comes to criteria that I know a lot of you are starting to screen and identify students for gifted services. Get that criteria out and we're going to look at it together, but you look at it too and you you uh, make sure that that you understand what it says and that you can express that, especially to your GT selection and placement committee uh, or committees. So make sure that you follow those, re those regulations. Also, it's really important to gather a minimum of those three evidences, and it's really, really important that you document that, that you put it into a folder for that child, and that you save it so that if that child moves somewhere else, you can send that information uh, to the next district. It's really important to have that information for monitoring if you're selected for monitoring. So make sure you're gathering those evidences that they are multiple criteria. We're going to talk more about that and that you are saving them. All right, let's talk for a second about the GT Selection and Placement Committee. So this is part of our regulation that you have to assemble a committee and they are going to do these four things here. They're going to, uh, you want to make sure that, they, that you've got the appropriate uh, members. Uh, that's in section one uh, is definition number 17 and uh, it says to have a gifted education coordinator or a gifted education teacher, a representative from classroom teachers, administrators, counselors, special education teachers and other appropriate staff. So make sure that you, you know, you have a GT selection and placement committee. I personally think it's good to have one at each school or maybe one at each uh, grade um, band level because those are the those are the people who know the students the best and they can help to um, to give input about those students. 
Also, it's the uh, duty and role of this committee or committees to ensure the committee understands the criteria for each, each category. And I can't even emphasize that enough. You know, they need to know what 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 to be looking for in order to ensure that you are identifying those students correctly. Also, you know, you need to be to, they need to know what it is to um, to be looking for students with disabling conditions. Um, you know that they need to know that there are special criteria or special considerations that are given to students who are uh, students who've been identified for a special education program uh, uh, or if they're disadvantaged in some way and um, also underachieving students that their um, you know, special criteria can be considered for that or discussions that need to be ha had. And then uh, it's also their purpose to discuss and decide services for students once identified. All right, so next we're going to talk about some uh, general evidence from the regulation. This is from Section 3. All right, so in the regulation, there's a laundry list or what I'd like to call kind of your general overall um, list of evidences that can be collected for your formally identified students. And then also in section three, when you look at subsection 12, it gives specific criteria for each of the five categories. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, each one of these, and I'm going to try to give you some examples, and then we're also going to look at the specific criteria for each of the categories. So portfolios, what is a portfolio? Well, our portfolio, portfolio is a collection of evidence that demonstrates student performance. And you can collect this in multiple different ways. They're usually, like I said, they're work samples, or they may be other types of things that that you're going that that student can collect or you can help that student collect. Um, oftentimes people uh, collect artwork samples, musical recordings, drama monologues, um, pictures of students with awards copies of awards, you know, their certificate, playbill, playbills with the student's name on it, uh, written work, you know, stories with open responses. These are all different types of portfolios. They can be collected for several of the different categories. Another evidence that can be collected is checklist and continuous progress data. So when I think about, you know, checklist, especially for a category, uh, when you look at um, the specific categories, it says to collect those those checklists of behavior specific to that category. It, it shouldn't be just a general overall uh, checklist. It needs to be those um, those those characteristics specific to like creativity or to visual and performing art. And you could use the, the jot downs that are in the GT sample handbook for that. Uh, those have a lot of good um, you know, checklist of behaviors, and they are specific to each category for each student. Also, when you think about collecting continuous progress data, it's not one data point. You know, you're looking for some some sort of data that you're collecting over a period of time. Uh, samples of that could be, you know, progress reports. It could be report cards. It could be diagnostic assessments that your students give. There are multiple different ways that that kind of um, progress can be kept, but it's not just one uh, uh, one data, one one resource for a student. All right, let's talk about anecdotal records and nominations, formal testing data and parent interviews. So what are anecdotal records? OK, anecdotal records are detailed descriptive narratives that are recorded after a behavior or interaction occurs, right? Um, it's it uh, needs to say, you know, I saw Johnny doing X. We were doing X. Uh, this is why I feel like, you know, Johnny should be referred for whatever. Um, it's really important to know uh, what an anecdotal record is, that it's not just uh, you know, I think Johnny's a great student. Uh, he participates in uh, class well. Um, you know, he's doing well in class. It needs to be a specific behavior, you know, a, a specific uh, instance where that teacher or staff member saw that student uh, doing whatever. 
And these are really important, especially for some of our um, uh, non-state tested areas for creativity, for leadership, leadership especially. And it's really important. We'll talk about that a little bit more about how those narratives need to fit some of those criteria that are in the regulation. Peer nominations. So this is just a, a method of, um, you know, asking uh, participants like other students to nominate or rank their peers. Um, formal testing data uh, specific to gifted categories. And we'll talk about that a little bit more about uh, especially for general intellectual ability and for specific academic aptitude. And then parent interviews and questionnaires. These are often used uh, to help identify or give evidence for our students. But you need to make sure that when you're um, you know, creating those parent interviews or questionnaires uh, that they understand what is necessary to be gathered because some of the criteria have specific things that, that those parents and staff need to be um, looking for and documenting in the in this evidence in their interviews or questionnaires. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the primary review committee recommendation for those entering fourth grade. So I'll see this as often as I'm uh, reviewing student record information and just remember that it's not a double dip situation. And by double dip, I mean where you've brought the evidence to the primary talent uh, pool committee and they have selected that student for primary talent pool. And then you say, oh, they were selected for primary talent pool. So now I'm going to say, well, that will, uh, you know, be an evidence for fourth grade. Now, what needs to occur there is that your primary talent pool uh, meets as a committee at the end of third grade, beginning of fourth grade. To, to look at that at those students who are in the primary talent pool to see if they should be recommended for formal selection. So it's a separate process from meeting to review primary talent pool information. Self nomination or a petition system. This is pretty self explanatory, I think, but this is where the student uh, nominates himself or the district has a process um, uh, to petition. Uh, this is one of those policies and procedures that's got to be covered. And so this is where you've got a, a procedure in place whereby the parent or student uh, contacts uh, someone at the district level and there may be a form to complete. And then there's a review of that to ensure that that student wasn't missed. Student awards or critiques or performance of pro uh, products specific to gifted categories. So these again are be honors or evaluations or evidence of high achievement in a specific category. Like for example, if a student went to the Kentucky Music Educators Association and they participated in a contest of some kind and they got a, a critique back from that, that could be used. Or if that student went somewhere and they received an award, you know, you could capture that through a picture or through their uh, through the certification, which again would be a good a good place to um, to add that to that uh, students portfolio. And then other valid and reliable documentation. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but recommendations aren't listed um, in this general list of criteria. But often, I mean more often than not, when I'm monitoring that is one of the first things I see is a teacher recommendation. And so this is where that other valid, valid and reliable documentation comes from. And so you just need to remember that rec recommendations are a formal letter usually that explains why a person is uh, appropriately qualified. Now, if it's not a formal letter of some kind, maybe it's got, you know, part of it is they're maybe checking some boxes of checklists of things that they see for that, that uh, student. That could be part of it, but also to make that uh, referral stronger, there should be some sort of maybe anecdotal observations or some sort of short narrative written about where they have seen these characteristics for that child. To me, that makes a, a stronger recommendation. All right, next we're going to talk about specific criteria for the formal categories for gifted identification. Let me see how I'm doing on time here. All right, we're at 926 here. Central Standard Time and 10:26. All right, so let's talk uh, about the specific criteria for the formal 
formally for formal categories for gifted identification. So just remember before identification begins, um, you know, it's kind of like a marathon is what it is for me. There are things that you need to know before the process begins. It's not a sprint. You know, this can take several weeks, several months to gather information for a student and then be able to bring it before uh, your, your GT selection and uh, placement committee. Uh, remember that it's really important to review that criteria with your staff and especially your GT selection and placement committee. Create a process to ensure you know, that the minimum of three evidences are collected and documented for each GT uh, student's category. Uh, create you know, a process for when students enroll, new students enroll in the district to ensure the GT record is imported. That's really important um, because uh, GT records don't automatically transfer over with the child. Check your data standards for more information about that. Um, and just remember, if there are enrollment or support staff who assist with entering GT records, uh, that you review with them the GT data standards or you review with them the process um, that has to be implemented in order to import those student records. And then once the records are imported, it's important to remember that you know you need to reach out to the GT uh, coordinator in the previous district to get the the hard copies of their documentation, their GSSPs, all those different things. Um, so don't forget to review those GT data standards for how to enter um, things into Infinite Campus, and we're also going to go over over that as well. So let's talk about general intellectual ability. So just remember that with general intellectual ability, a student has to score on the night stay nine on a full scale comprehensive test of intellectual ability. And just remember a full scale test of intellectual ability includes verbal, nonverbal and quantitative uh, sub assessments. Um, you know, some some good examples of that. Again, I am not you know, pushing these. I don't get any payback from these companies. But some examples I've seen used are the Cognitive Abilities Test or the COGAT and the Oslin and Student Ability Test, the OLSAT. Um, so whenever you see that word shall, that means must in the regulation. So that has to occur. OK, also it says may. And so it may include these other things, right? So it can include high performance and additional individual group intellectual assessment. So say you've given, you know, uh, you know, um, that cognitive ability test, that full scale test of cognitive ability. Uh, but let's say that student maybe doesn't score at the ninth day nine, but you've got other evidence that shows that this is a high ability learner. You know, you might want to give them, you know, a separate test. You can't give them the same test again because that wouldn't be valid. It'd have to be a different cognitive ability test. You can also have, you know, uh, these observations of applied uh, reasoning or that checklist of inventories of uh, behavior specific to underachieving or disadvantaged gifted learners. All right. This is how you would enter a general intellectual ability um, record into Infinite Campus. Uh, remember to ensure that you gather different types of evidences for each of the gifted categories. Sometimes what I've seen in Infinite Campus um, is that someone has taken that um, cognitive abilities test and they have, uh, to me, it looks like they've used that one thing for three different evidences and they've checked informal assessment. They've checked night stay nine on comprehensive test of intellectual ability, and they've also checked high performance on an intellectual assessment assessment. Remember, we're looking for multiple criteria, so three different sources of how this student was identified for this particular um, area. Remember to look at the whole child. And if you don't have enough evidence, remember to put that child on your watch list and continue to gather evidence uh, from that for that child. Let's talk a little bit about special considerations. Special considerations is covered in section four. And if you're going to be using special considerations, it's good to have, you know, kind of a process in place. And again, for your GT selection and placement committee to understand what that process is. 
Um, so this would be if a student didn't uh, score at the ninth day nine, but at your uh, GT selection and, and placement committee, uh, the district, um, your district committee or your school committee, uh, they say, well, I really feel like Johnny is a really high potential learner. And in talking about Johnny, they they see that there's either a disabling condition of some kind. He maybe is a special ed student or maybe he's an underachieving student. Um, you know, uh, you may have to do a little more uh, research on that child and come back to discuss again. Um, but when you would, uh, you know, note this in infinite campus, if you decide this student is a special consideration student, then you would you would select, you know, special considerations, right? And you would choose one of these from the drop down list. And then you would still uh, need to select, you know, three different evidences. And my example here is not a good one because I don't have three evidences here. Um, I need to select one more. But you could select, select something like a checklist of inventories for underachieving and disadvantaged students. You could select, you know, referrals, recommendations, teachers. Uh, you could also maybe select, you know, maybe they had a high performance on an intellectual uh, test of a um, of, a, of a, a student ability, but it wasn't at the ninth day nine. So different things could be, uh, you know, checked here. Continuous progress data that would be good at evidence to show that a student is doing well. Um, so there are different things that could be checked, but you do need to check, um, you know, if you're going to use special considerations, that special considerations checkbox, and that was something new, I believe, that was added last year. Let's talk about uh, specific academic aptitude. Uh, remember that you have to have a composite composite score in the, on the ninth day nine and one of the subject test scores of an achievement test. There are many different types of achievement tests out there. Many people either use the Iowa test of basic skills or they use the, the new Iowa, which is focused more on the standards. Uh, people use the Terra Nova. People use MAP or different diagnostic assessments uh, that also meet the um, the uh, regulation criteria uh, and then you can also use you know high performance again on a, a individual or group test student awards or critiques um, you know if you had a student that went to uh, maybe academic gover the governor's academic uh, achievement um, competition and did well that could be used off level testing that means that you've got a student who's maybe in fourth grade but you've given them a uh, end of year fifth grade assessment. Some people do that. Um, portfolio of high academic performance. Again, we've talked about that. That would be where you're collecting this evidence from observations, awards, different types of things. And then student progress data. We've also talked about that as well. When you enter that student's record into Infinite Campus, remember you, you've got to select that within the ninth day nine score on a subject test score of achievement. That has to be selected unless the, the GT selection uh, placement committee decides that you're using um, special considerations. And then you would select two other evidences. And I often see checklist of inventories and referrals and recommendations from teachers. Um, don't forget to document that again into that student's folder. Make sure that you've got all of that information uh, collected and documented for that student. And then if you're using special uh, considerations, then you would note that like you would for um, general intellectual ability. But of course, it's for specific academic um, aptitude. All right, creativity. This is one where I have seen um, some issues this past year during monitoring. Um, the regulation says it has to be determined through the use of informal or formal assessment measures. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that informal or formal assessment measures. So you've got to either give some sort of assessment. It can be a formal assessment like the uh, Torrance test of creativity, or it can be one like the Williams. Um, I forget what it's called test of creativity, or it may be a uh, battery, that type of thing or it can be informal assessment. Uh, Fayette County shared with us several years ago, you know, a little screener that they use, that's kind of an informal assessment, uh, but it has to be some sort of assessment. 
uh, that you're looking for, either formal or informal assessment. Um, and those assessments have to measure the child's capacity for these, these four things. Um, originality of thought, okay, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You know, a, a child can think of original things, things that other children wouldn't be able to see. And when you're doing a, an assessment, uh, you'll be able to see that as you compare it with other work that you've done with a screener. Those students who are, have original thoughts, it'll be, they'll really bubble to the top. You'll be able to see that. Uh, fluency, fluency is, you know, um, being able to have this original originality of thought multiple ways, multiple times, that type of thing. Um, like, for example, if you ask a kid, you know, write down um, how many ways you could use a paper clip. And maybe I could come up with five, but a student who's got fluency, they could come up with a hundred, right? So that's what I'm talking about with fluency. Elaboration has to do with details. Oftentimes when you give like a test, like the Torrance test of creativity, elaboration uh, as students uh, draw or they write about something, it's, it's, it's in the details of what you can see that that student has, um, has created for uh, their their uh, object. And then flexibility of thought, you know, they don't get pinned down to one thing. They're able to think of different ways, changes, or well, what if we did this, what about that, you know, that type of thing. Um, so it's just really important that you're documenting these, these types of things for creativity and remembering that it's this, uh, that you've got to use uh, informal or formal assessments that measure those four different characteristics for those child. Uh, then you've got the May part that's covered there, uh, which would be, you know, creative writing samples, high scores on a test of creative, te creative test of ability. And they give, you know, two examples there, uh, checklist of observations that's specific to creativity, and then that observation of original ideas, products, or problem solving. All right. Next, we're going to talk about entering a creativity record. So um, remember, you're going to, um, you know, check either formal assessment or, or informal assessment. I should have checked that on the box there. I need to fix that. Um, that has to be a part of that student's record. And then, um, you know, you're looking for those other evidences that help to, to strengthen that student's identification. Uh, with those other four areas of originality, fluency, elaboration, and flexibility. Uh, often people use, like I said, these anecdotal observations uh, and checklists that are specific to creativity. And again, um, you know, those jot downs would be a, a really good way to collect that information. All right, almost to the end of this section here, let's talk about leadership. So, uh, regulations, we all need to be on the same page with regulations. That's why I'm going over these, especially for during this season of time. Um, that leadership is determined by informal measures. Um, some people use formal measures, but it says informal measures there. And the documentation of willingness. You know, what is willingness? Willingness is not necessarily I've done it, you know, um, but they would be given the opportunity they would do it. Right. And so and you want that student that shows uh, leadership roles, not that they've just participated, but they have shown a willingness to assume that leadership role. And then it gives uh, three different areas that we have to collect evidence for that student on. We have to collect student for a class. You know, maybe they've done something in class or they've led a group or they've been a teacher or assistant or something like that in a student organization. Um, you know, a student organization, that's pretty broad. That could be a club, that could be the honor society, that could be something that goes on, you know, at the elementary level, middle, high school level, and a community activity. And that's really uh, wide and broad as well. Uh, there's all different types of community activities that go on. And um, I know during this season of pandemic, people have, have come up with different ways uh, to think about these types of things. And we've got a video that's on the GT Resources webpage done by some colleagues. And this really goes into leadership a lot more than I'm going to go into it today. But I would urge you to check that out. Uh, but we've, you've got to have 
uh, documentation of those of those three areas and that willingness and that leadership piece. It can't just be participation. And then it can include those other things, sociograms, which are questionnaires that are designed to assess leadership characteristics. You know, it might be um, uh, some questions, you know, who do you, who would you turn to to help you with the class activity or project? Um, who seems to uh, be one of the first people people to uh, volunteer for a project or those types of things. Um, peer recommendations, that's where you maybe pass out a survey to the students in your class and they, through different questions or open-ended, you know, questions would, would answer about, you know, I feel like Joe Schmo uh, would do that. Um, Again, those behavioral checklists are really important, but they need to be specific to leadership behavior. Uh, portfolio entries, that's really a good way to capture information for a student. We've talked about portfolios and then offices held by a student in an extracurricular activity or class government. So those are the mays. Those don't have to be the must. The must is that part that's up at the very first uh, uh, portion of, the, of this uh, slide. Then entering it. These are all things that are in the data standards, but make sure that you do it correctly. Follow the standards so we're all doing it the same way. You've got to click that um, checkbox that says that you've got that documentation of student leadership in community class and student organization. And then you uh, click three other boxes. I haven't done a very good job of giving you an example here. Sorry about that. Of where you've documented this, this, uh, uh, this criteria. So it could be a checklist of inventories, referrals, rec recommendations, teachers, uh, or it might be, um, you know, student awards or critiques or, uh, you know, sociograms or nominations of self or petition. All right, visual and performing arts. This will be the last one and then I'll be able to stop and take some questions. Just look and see what my time here. Got quarter to 10. OK, we're doing good. All right, so the visual and performing arts. So again, in the regulation, that first section there gives some very important criteria that must be followed, right? Because there's the word must. So VPA must be determined through evidence of a performance. OK, what is a performance? A performance is where a student uh, shows what they can do uh, either in front of an audience, uh, they recorded in a digital way, but they are doing what they do. Um, and showing you that they can do it, right? And so this can be done in several different ways. This can be recorded in several different ways. A school could ho hold auditions where students show what they can do, their skills and talents. Uh, it can be through letters of recommendation, right? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about letters of recommendation, but very important that people who write those letters know that they need to be writing about what they've seen that student be able to do, that performance piece. Um, product or portfolio assessment by specialist or professional artist. So maybe you've got, uh, you know, a student who's done some um, visual art. You're recommending them for visual art, and so you're collecting the different types of artwork that, that student can that that student can do. That's great to collect it, but then as you can see, there has to be an assessment. You know, so you can use a rubric. Uh, the judges or specialists or professional artists can write about the things that they see in that product or portfolio, but it can't just be the portfolio and, you know, you let that be it. It has to be assessed. All right. Um, it says may include critiques or performance. OK, awards, critiques or performance. That's good. Or portfolio of visual performing arts ability, right? Um, that seems to be a little bit contradictory to what's up there at the top, but just remember if you do an audition, uh, that's going to be a performance. If you want to, you know, also have some awards or critiques, you can do that. Uh, you can also have a portfolio that's assessed in some manner along with that audition. So I think that's why that's there. Again, it's really important for faculty and parents and others uh, to be aware, like I said, about this performance piece that as they write about it, they're, they're talking about what they saw that student do, um, you know, say they saw that student perform in a play and they talk about, uh, you know, the different pieces to drama that they saw that student uh, do. 
and then recommendations, the same thing. You know, how they have observed that performance piece. Very important that that is documented. Then as you enter um, a visual performing arts record in Infinite Campus, remember that one of these evidences has to be ch chosen because of the criteria that's in the regulation. So one of these, not all of them, but you know, auditions, uh, letters of recommendation, portfolio assessment, or products, paper, video, whatever. And it really needs to have out there assessment by a specialist professional artist if you, you know, need to think about that. Um, so uh, oftentimes though you'll see like uh, products or paper or whatever, and sometimes you'll you'll see where that person has talked about that and that recommended them for that. But sometimes all you see is the portfolio and you see no discussion by any kind of specialist. So that's a really important part of that regulation criteria to remember. Um, and then, you, you know, like I said, you'll see checklist of uh, behaviors oftentimes, or you'll see a recommendation from a teacher. I see those the most when I'm out monitoring. All right, so I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions. And if you'll, uh, you can either unmute yourself or you can uh, type something in the chat there. I'll try to come over here and help monitor that. Um, Miss Kathy, I've written down the questions. If you want me to just uh, ask you the ones that were in the chat. Awesome. That would be great, Hannah. OK, um, earlier Miss Tammy Dotson had a question wondering if there was a handout uh, and I'm assuming that was about the primary talent pool lookouts or look fors. Uh, I do believe that there is some information on the GT Research Resources web page. Um, so look there, if not, um, but I think there is. And then there's a, you know, a primary talent pool brochure that's also there on the GT Resources web page. Um, Elisa Brown, she had asked that if, uh, could we get slides to take notes on during the session? So I guess will the slides be available or are they available now? They'll be available after the session. Okay. Uh, Kim Sumner, she asked, can a student still be identified in the GI areas without scoring in the not stay not? They can. Uh, you need to think about those, those special uh, considerations, and that would be something that would be discussed by your um, GT Selection and Placement Committee. Um, the regulation gives three specific criteria or three specific uh, populations of students for that. It also says any disabling condition that would mask a student's uh, abilities. So that's why it's so important to have those discussions with your Selection and Placement Committee. Uh, Miss Janet Frazier had a couple of questions. She had asked if you would revisit and explain again the information of GIA high performance on intellectual assessment. She said that she's not really clear on what high means and that she's struggling to use it with the not stain on ability test. Well, first of all, you've got to have, if you're not using special considerations, you've got to have that ninth stain on piece. Okay. And then the criteria says that you can also have, you know, other high ability pieces. And that might be students who don't score at the ninth day nine, but maybe they score, you know, at the eighth day nine. The regulation is not clear about that, uh, but you, unless you're using special, uh, special considerations, students have to score at the ninth day nine. She had another question. Uh, she says, with special considerations, some students have the not stain on on ability, but struggle to produce work. So may the not stain on be marked and the special consideration be used to explain or replace one of the other evidences, say the portfolio of evidence or continuous progress. That's a good question. Read that, read that part again, Hannah. Yes, she said with special considerations, some students have the not stain on on ability, but struggle to produce work. May the not stain on be marked and the special consideration be used to explain, replace 
one of the other evidences, say the portfolio of evidence or continuous progress? I think it could because the regulation says that you are using special considerations um, as an exception to the criteria. So I think it could. Angie Davison, she had asked, is the folder and the portfolio the same thing? Also, no. is there a, okay. And she said, also, is there a place to look at a good example of a portfolio? Um, I don't know that we have any examples on the KDE webpage, uh, but if she'll contact me through email, I'll try to uh, help her with that. A portfolio is where you're collecting evidence for a student to um, capture that criteria of evidence for whatever uh, area they're being referred for. A GT folder is where you put that evidence to keep for documentation purposes. That's the difference between those two different things. And here are some recent questions that came in the chat. Uh, Kim okay. Sumner is asking if anyone has a visual art rubric that can be used for the assessment by the specialist. Um, and I seen that Miss Angie Henderson had said that she had has one, but if anyone else maybe has one to submit. Miss Amy Goin Goins had asked, can third grade scores from MAPS or iReady be used to identify an SAA or should this wait until fourth grade? Yes, you can start at the end of third grade to identify students for services and you can use MAP and you can use, what was the other one? Iowa. Uh, I ready. I ready, yes. Both of those are uh, meet the, the criteria. Sarah Jennings asks, is it required to have the PTP and the GT review committee separate or could they be one committee with members across appropriate grade levels? They could be uh, one committee with uh, representatives across multiple grade levels. And Terry Haycraft asks, do we or do you or we need to document three pieces of evidence in addition to checking student leadership documentation or including this piece of evidence? So you you have to document those three things. And by clicking that in Infinite Campus, you are showing that you've got documentation for that. And then you're going to click those three things that support the fact that you um, have that willingness in those three areas. And then um, I had a question about the GSSPs and progress reports. Do those transfer through Infinite Campus? if a student were to move districts? Good question. So we're working on that in Infinite Campus. The new forms do not transfer. The old legacy forms, that would be the form that was had both the GSSP and progress report on it, it does transfer. 